Hi everyone, welcome to MCBC. Let me introduce my family. We are the Tangs family. My name is Catherine. This is Nelson. This is Emma. And this is Joshua. Today we would like to share with you two verses from the Bible. It's from Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. <laughs> Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Um, the reason uh, we selected this first um, was because I had a, a couple of uh, very challenging days at work. And um, God brought me to this first to, to encourage me. Um, as these negative and bad thoughts come into my mind, um, I just kept reciting this first over and over. Uh, and uh, God guided me out of this challenge. And I'm very thankful for his word. Um, I hope that this verse and his word will encourage you this week. And Enjoy the service. service! Give me eyes to see Behold, still my anxious heart. Take what I have known and break it all apart. You, my God, are greater still. Give me eyes to see. what I have known and break it all apart. You, my God, are greater still. And no sky contains, no doubt restrains all you are. The greatness of separate us and there is nothing that can ever separate us
miss from your love No life, no death Of this I am convinced You, my God, are greater still And no words can say or song convey All you are, the greatness of our God in my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are the greatness of our God and no sky contains no doubt restrains all you are the greatness of our God I spend my
the saints around the throne How can I keep from singing your praise? How could I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King And it makes my heart I know I am loved by the King And it makes my heart want to sing It was around July when we entered stage three, if you remember, and I heard of the news of Ennio Morricone's passing. And for those of you who don't know who Ennio Morricone is, uh, you might have heard of uh, the, the director of which he uh, composed music for, Sergio Leone. If you still don't know that, maybe I can play you a little bit and you may be reminded of Ennio Morricone. Now the movie I watched wasn't The Good and Bad and Ugly from which this soundtrack is from, but from uh, another one uh, by Clint Eastwood called A Fistful of Dollars. And Clint Eastwood plays this kind of drifter who uh, went into a town with two rival gangs and the two rival gangs are, have already you know, set up uh, there and wanted to uh, basically exploit uh, the, the, the people in the town. And uh, I don't know if you know about uh, the whole uh, genre of spaghetti western, but one of the things that normally happens is there's the showdown, where the two guys, the good guy and the bad guy, and if you look at uh, this movie, the, the, the good guy who's good and who's bad is a little more mixed, but regardless, they would be standing uh, back to back from one another or standing very far from one another, and their hands are near where the holster is, where the first person who shoots the other person would win. And uh, two men of equal skills, equal numbers, that's one, and equal chance of killing the other, either to save the town or continue to exploit it. Why do I have to talk about showdowns? Well, back in uh, November 8, we were exploring this series called The Days of Elijah. We see how God was using the prophets uh, to about bring about judgment on Israel through drought of being cast into the land. At first glance, we seem to be reading a biblical character profile of Elijah the Tishbite, the uh, prophet that God has called. In reality, 
if you look at the story uh, from greater detail, it's almost like a showdown. It's between uh, the prophets of Baal, who is uh, supported by King Ahab, who is an Israelite who should be supporting instead uh, the Israel uh, God Yahweh. His wife Jezebel definitely not supporting uh, God because she has brought the Phoenician um, a, a God, which is really an idol, Baal, along with a host of Baal prophets that have infiltrated uh, the Israeli land. And so there's that side. And then on the other side, you have God and his chosen servant, Elijah. And we do hear, if you remember, in uh, earlier part of 1 Kings 18, in November 8, that there was this guy who actually served in Obadiah's court, uh, I mean in uh, Ahab's court, Obadiah. He actually uh, did manage to gather two groups of 50 prophets of the Lord and hid them so that Jezebel could not kill them. And so you have these two sides. But right now, it really seems like it's only Elijah the Tishbite against 800 prophets of Baal and the whole regime that has set and bent against him. So, what are the odds in Elijah's favor? What are the chances that the people, and yes, and then there's the people, the people of Israel. What are the chances of these people choosing the greater, mighty, uh, more numerous people uh, that worship Baal? Or will they choose a God and return to him? And this is what Elijah is facing. And this is what sometimes are in our life we're facing too. Isn't life sometimes like this? That the odds are stacked against us. Maybe a bad prognosis uh, from your doctor. Maybe, try as we, we might, we're trying to get higher grades, but we can never achieve that GPA that we wanted in order for us uh, to get maybe scholarship or something. Maybe it's having that argument with our spouse again, and we're not sure whether we can make it through another argument uh, without things getting even more nasty. Maybe it's waking up in the morning and realizing you're still working from home and your kids are crying and maybe the older one is on online Zoom but couldn't get the computer to work and you have to juggle between all of them. Odds are often stacked against us in every part of our lives. So what do we do? So today we're going to look at this showdown at Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And if there's a big idea that I want you to remember, it is this. God will fight for us when we stop fighting for ourselves. God will fight for us when we stop fighting for ourselves. Let's see what we can learn about God fighting for his name, for his servant, and for his people, and how it can apply to us today. Ahab, of course, was more than willing, upon hearing um, uh, uh, Elijah approaching him, and said, uh, you know, bring the people of Israel, because... This is the perfect opportunity for him to gather at Carmel and should this showdown, uh, should Elijah lost in this showdown, then he can legitimately get rid of him because he's been uh, eluding him for, for the longest time. But now he showed up, hey, fresh bait. But as we will see, God will have his final say. And when people came, what Elijah first said was very striking. In 1 Kings 18, 21, it says, And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer his word. The idea here is, of course, that people have to make a choice. They can't continue uh, in this syncretistic relationship. Syncretism just means that you are worshiping or you are trusting in uh, more than one God. So, whereas monotheist is one. Uh, syncretistic means you're blending uh, various gods. Because you can't, in one way, trust uh, the worship of Baal for your crops because he's the, supposedly the god of rain and also the god of fertility uh, if you want more children. While if, oh, Baal doesn't work, then I'm going to go back to God. It doesn't work that way. The word go limping is both ironic and symbolic. 
It's ironic because later on we're going to see exactly the prophets of Baal lipping around the altar, uh, trying to call up on Baal to show up and, and, and win the, the showdown for them. But it is also symbolic because this word limping also gives us or reminds us uh, the word of a crutch. See, that's what the Israelites are doing, isn't it? They basically have one side leaning on the prophet of Baal and one side leaning on God. They want the best of both worlds. Well, in this world, and especially in God's eyes, you can never have two uh, to choose from. God wants our absolute obedience. So, and, and as a result, uh, Elijah pushes them for a decision. Will you choose Baal or will you choose God? The Israelites didn't answer him. And in fact, this idea of answer plays very prominently in what we're looking at. And so here's our first point. God fights for us by answering our call for help. First uh, Kings chapter 18, 23 to 29. It says, let two bowls be given to us and let them choose one bowl for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bow and prepare it first. For you are many and call upon the name of your God and put no fire to it. And then took the bow and they took the bow and that was given to them. And they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, Oh Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they limped around the altar they had made. And at noon, Elijah began mocking them and saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or maybe he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. And they cry more louder, and they cut themselves after the customs with swords and lances, until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Verse 24, it says, God who answers by fire, he is God. Verse 26, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. Verse 29, near the end, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. And including verse 21, in which the people of Israel did not answer Elijah, this word answer repeats again and again. And the reason is simple and rooted in Old Testament understanding, as my beloved professor, Dr. Victor Shepherd, loves to say, the quintessential characteristic of God is that he speaks. The quintessential characteristic of God is that he speaks. He addresses us and we hear. To hear is the same root meaning uh, of the word to obey. When God addresses us, we hear and obey. His speech creates as he did in Genesis when he created the heavens and the earth and every other creature in it. But conversely, an idol is not real. And therefore, they don't speak, they don't understand, and they can't act. The psalmist says in Psalm 115, 4 to 8, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see, they have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell, they have hands but do not feel, they have uh, feet but do not walk and they do not make a sound in their throats those who make them become like them so do all who trust him now i would love to audibly hear god answer me as i recently read moses relationship with the lord as one speaks to his friend in my devotion I'm so jealous of that relationship and in some ways though not audible by his act of answering prayer by just a nugget of truth in scripture, or even by meditating in silence and to hear, try to hear God from the distractions of life, we can discover God is a God who speaks and therefore answers. An amazing thing happened a few days ago when I was talking to my friend Jim uh, about feeling far from God. That I feel, you know, tired and discouraged and Jim so wisely encouraged me and he said, uh, you know what, God has been impressing on my heart that I was praying for you and he asked me to tell you, read Psalm 18 
read Psalm 18 and read it for a whole month just on Psalm 18, nothing else. And as soon as an idea comes into your head, journal it, write it down. And I was a little bit skeptical at first. But then I go to my Facebook uh, Messenger, which I do uh, uh, look at every day, and I have a Rwandan friend that I met uh, several years back because of a mission trip I went to Rwanda. And for some reason around maybe last year, he started sending me daily uh, passages uh, in pictures in scripture. And what should I see? But Psalm 18 verse 3. I know God was calling me. I know God was saying, I want you to have little doubt because I have answered you. I've answered you through none of this being a coincidence. Read Psalm 18 and remember my love for you. Thanks to God. And also, we're also given a, given a few principles of how to ask in a way that God uh, will answer. In 1 Kings 18, 36 to 37, it says, And at the time of the oblation of the uh, uh, offering, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their backs. Elijah confidently speaks to the true God who hears and acts by reminding those around him that their ancestors believe in the Lord God and that they are the people of the Lord God, Elijah being God's servant, God's representative, just as Moses was. He, he obeys and obeys God only. And all of which is to convince all these people who are still double-minded in all they do, these limping Israelites, that they need to give up their Baal crutch repent from their idolatry, and turn their hearts toward God. Perhaps our cry for help and God's answer isn't for us and us alone then, isn't it? Uh, though an answer from, uh, 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 helps us immediately, of course. It's also that we make his name known so that he gets the glory and he gets the honor and praise. Elijah knows the power of asking a God who answers because he can change our stubborn hearts from going one way to going his way. And so God indeed answered. God answered by fire, which consumed the offering, the altar, everything. He truly is God. When we cry out to this God, he will answer us. This brings us quickly to our second point. God fights for us by displaying his might against overwhelming odds. God fights for us by displaying his might through overwhelming odds. So Elijah challenged to the prophets of Baal and Asher is simple. As I said before, they're on equal footing. They have the equal amount of resources, two bowls. And Elijah even graciously said, hey, you can have a first dips and choose the bowl that you want. And I'll choose the one that you don't want. And, and then you can cut it to pieces. I can cut it to pieces. You can set it to an altar. I can set it to an altar. And you can try to light it up, but you can't use fire. You have to call up on your God, Baal, to light it in fire. Whereas I will call up on my God and light it in fire. The true God will be the one that will consume the elements, the altar, and the offering. And so, the prophets of Baal began their ritual, and they went from morning to noon, calling, Oh, Baal, answer us. Oh, Baal, answer us. But Baal doesn't answer them. Not a word. There was no action. So they started dancing and limping around, you know, probably like tribal people, and still there was no answer. And by now, Elijah was getting a little amused, so he started mocking them. He mocked them four ways. He mocked them and said, Hey, could it be that uh, your God... Uh, is musing. He's just thinking. So can't be bothered with you right now. He's busy thinking of other things. He can't be in two places at once. He can't think of two things at the same time. Or maybe he's relieving himself. Well, that's that's almost insulting. He's on a journey, uh, like going on hunting, as uh, ancient Ugaritic texts that talks about Baal uh, often portrays him. 
or worse, he's asleep and need to be awakened. This sleep to be awakened one is even more crazy because there are points in the Ugaritic text that talks about Baal being dead. And that explains why there's no rain because if the God who is in charge of all agriculture is dead, then that's why crops die in the winter or when it's dry. It's their way of explaining it was because Baal is dead. So he needs to be awakened. And so these taunts and mocking made uh, Elijah's opponents uh, work all the more harder to try to get their God to do something, anything. So they start cutting themselves and blood gushes out. It was a total mess. And more time has passed. And by now, there is still no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. And I think I've already alluded to the point that there were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 uh, prophets of Asherah. That's a total of 850 people in, on one side, all surrounding this big altar. It must have been a huge altar. And then there was one tiny, maybe getting old man, Elijah, standing for God. And you would think by probability that, hey, if there's a f 850 of them, one of them must be at least able to tap into the line uh, and, and call Baal and say, hey, Baal, come over here and help us. Except no one does. Maybe because Baal was indeed not a real god. He was an idol. He can't answer. He can't answer. And he can't pray for them. And he can't certainly lit the altar on fire. The sheer number of 850 to 1 should make Elijah afraid. But Elijah is not afraid because he knows the true God, the real God is with him. He doesn't even need the hundred prophets that Obadiah has hidden. He is willing to face these uh, oppressive powers because God wants to display his power through him. Elijah being unafraid, rebuilt the altar shortly after midday. He has very little time left before night falls. And he tells them to stop. It's time for me to call on my God. Uh, he rebuilt the altar as God commanded and with symbolic arrangement of 12 stones, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he made a trench deep enough for water to overflow four times. Not once, not twice, but four times. He asked that the altar and the wood be doused with water. So much so that even if he were to cheat and light a fire, the altar would not lit up because it is so drenched with water. And at God's appointed time of offering, he cried out as we read earlier, and God let a fire fall down onto this altar, onto this uh, bowl that was cut into pieces, and it melted, the altar melted, everything melted, and it even says in the scripture that the water is licked up. Every drop of water has evaporated. The sight finally makes these limping Israelites open their eyes for just a moment and their mouths open and they fall down on the ground and say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God in 1 Kings 18.39. God is victorious against overwhelming odds. So one principle we can take from here before we're done is that just because God will fight for us, it does not mean that we stand by idly. Yes, sometimes God will tell us not to do anything and he will take care of it. But more likely, he desires to partner with us uh, to accomplish his mighty works. Elijah still had to confront Ahab despite putting himself at great risk. He has to appear on Mount Carmel surrounded by the hostile a group of Baalic prophets and the king and a people that can at any moment turn against him. He still needs to build the altar. He still needs to pray. And then, and only then, does God swoop in and rescue his people from their idolatry and turn the tides so that in one sweeping victory, the prophets of Baal and Asherah are slaughtered by Israelites at the Brook Kishon. And Ahab flees. 
Not only that, the sky opens and the drought which was started uh, 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 that had devastated Israel and surrounding regions end with a meal and the prophet humbly at the top of Mount Carmel praying and just marveling at the power of God. And there appears this first cloud, the first of which will form many, many clouds and then a torrential downpour. The drought is over. Where might God be inviting you or me to partner with him against incredible odds? It may start with one phone call, maybe one reunion, maybe one simple gesture. Why would be one way to say, I'm here to listen? I think one of the saddest moments uh, when I was a youth pastor is to see a young person that you have groomed and you have invested in uh, turn away in their faith when they go into university. But now, as an English pastor now, I, I'm starting to wonder how much more the parents must have felt. That they were the ones that raised these sons and daughters, that took their little hands into VBC, took them to their very first Sunday school class, and with them crying and screaming just like they would uh, when they are uh, at the nursery. And how then they started hearing God's word and they started really enjoying it and then can't wait to tell their parents that I want to go back. And all of that, you know, continued into youth ministry. They still seem to be right on track. But when they go into university, either because of some temptation or whatever reason, they drop out of their faith. And that feeling of helplessness, that you can't do anything about it. To me, that drift, not like these mountain, you know, fire falling, mountain shaking experience is an incredible odd. Just think about how incredible and odd it is for someone whose heart is turned against God to turn towards God and believe. But when someone who's drifted away has a heart turned back toward God, and start to love God for who He is, starts to read His scripture, and even teaches others about God's word, and forsake the idols, forsake the lies, the untruth that He has uh, been taught in the past. When you see something like that, I believe that that's when God is turning against incredible odds. And you know what? Maybe that's what we need to pray for. Maybe that's what our cry is. There's so many of our university students out there. Some of them, some of you guys might be watching and you know, if, if that's you, great. But you may even know a friend who has drifted away. You knew them since, you know, they were your buddy buddies in, uh, in, in children uh, upstairs on second floor. Now we can't even go there and you saw them drift further and further away. And I'm not asking you to maybe even give them a call, but if that's what God's touching your heart to do, then go right ahead. But maybe it's just to simply name them before the God who can do all things, who can stand against all odds, a God who will answer and cry out their name to this God and ask him to show his mighty power to display his awesome works and win a son, a daughter, a friend, a grandchild back into the loving folds of Jesus. See, when we do that, when we realize that the battles are not on the Mount Carmel, but on our knees, praying and seeking God's help in our, in our everyday life, when we begin to realize that our relationship with God can be that like that of Elijah, we we'll begin to know just how powerful God is in a showdown where God is determined to be victorious. But we need to take that first step. Won't you, brothers and sisters of MCBC, join me join fellow parents and join a fellow students and begin to intercede for just one of these lives and see our God answer prayer against all.
us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this moment that we can pray and we can listen to your word and you place that person in our mind. And as now we come to a time of reflection, may you help us to know what we just heard, how to take it in, and how to respond to you obediently. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.